All right, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you, Gotham, for the great introduction. Um, as you said, I'll be talking to you about confidence intervals for the median. This work is joint work with Jörg Drexler, uh, Audrey McMillan, Jayshree Sarati, and Adam Smith. It's work that I uh, mostly did while I was at Boston University, the Hearing Institute, and uh, so that Jörg and Audra are the trained statisticians uh, on this paper, definitely not myself. Um, all right, so uh, I just wanted to, before I you know, get into the weeds, uh, throughout this talk, I'll be using uh, concentrated differential privacy as my privacy definition. It doesn't matter a ton, everything holds with epsilon delta differential privacy as well, um, but the results are specific to this definition. And if you're not familiar with it, you can just think about it as a, a notion of privacy that lies between peer and epsilon delta differential privacy. All right, so why do we consider medians? Just to be clear, these are uh, single dimensional medians. Uh, so we're moving back from the multivariate case that uh, was just talked about. But um, they're still interesting in this context, right? First of all, they're just like a useful summary statistic. Uh, we use them anytime you have like a skewed distribution. You, for example, uh, US income levels are a very skewed distribution and people like to use medians to talk about those since they're a lot more informative. Um, but also from a technical perspective, they're a little bit interesting because, um, well, they're pretty data dependent compared to a lot of other things. You can't just, you know, throw the Laplace mechanism at a median and get something useful. And it also wasn't super clear how to take a lot of the sort of standard point estimate techniques that had been developed for the median to get something nice like a confidence interval, right? So they offer this nice combination of uh, complexity and simplicity. So before I talk about um, the private version, I wanna talk about the non-private version of confidence intervals, right? Um, so let's just recall what a confidence interval is, right? So for a valid confidence interval, we just want this, uh, some like bounds, which I'm gonna call CIL and CIU, such that the population median lies in this interval with some probability one minus alpha, right? And in the non-private setting, our randomness is coming from the fact that we're imagining we're drawing samples from a greater population, right? So how do we find this interval in the non-parametric setting? Well, we have two different bad events. You know, the population median could be on that side or it could be on that side. Um, and we can bound the probability of each by alpha over two and then throw a union bound at it and proceed there, right? Helpfully, the rank of the population median and just from its definition, we can think, okay, that's gonna be distributed binomially. Um, so in order to find these upper and lower bounds, we can just uh, look at the CDF of the binomial distribution at the ranks like just to the left and just to the right of the median such that the CDF is, well, for, the, for the bat, this bad event, it would be one on the left. The CDF is less than or equal to alpha over two. Um, and we can just pick the order statistics uh, according to those ranks, which are parameterized by our alpha, and we can get a nice valid confidence interval. So like for a 95% confidence interval, this corresponds to like the looking at the 48th and 52nd um, quantile or something, and those will nicely bound our uh, median. So you might wonder, why are we bothering doing this non-parametrically instead of parametrically? And there's a couple of reasons for this. All right, so first of all, as we're all familiar with here, in general, when we're doing things in the private setting, we can't nicely visualize the data or do some nice goodness of fit testing, right? To see if our uh, parametric assumption is correct. You might say, okay, but like, you know, in an income setting, for example, we, you know, everyone always assumes that that data is log normal, why can't we do that here? Well, again, you could. That is some sort of like general like institutional knowledge that you could apply to the problem. The issue here is that misspecification leads to some pretty drastically bad bias. So for example, here is um, we, a lot of our testing we did on the 1940s census microdata. 
And here's a income distribution of the mountain region of the US, which is like kind of like Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Montana, et cetera, um, from that census. And if we use, uh, so this data is extremely centered at zero. So like lots of people had incomes around zero, but then you have this sort of like long tail going out. So the true median is actually around $500 of income. Um, and you can see those dotted lines around the turquoise true median. Um, those are, that's the non-parametric confidence interval that's correctly specifying it. And then in green, we have the log normal confidence interval, which is completely invalid and like centered towards zero, right? And if you were doing this in the private setting and you couldn't look at this picture to say, hey, this data is not log normal, you would be in trouble. So we don't want to do that. Um, and then, of course, you also might ask, well, why can't we use existing differential privacy techniques? And of course, we, we are going to. We're going to be relying on them quite heavily. But so first of all, just like out of the box, a lot of the uh, more general purpose, like bootstrapping type confidence interval techniques that have been developed, as far as I'm aware, and I am about two years out of date on this, um, generally require parametric or normality assumptions, or they might, uh, you know, do things uh, computationally and sometimes computationally, you know, sort of a computational approximation is good enough, but we were particularly interested in this case on getting some like uh, real mathematical validity guarantees. And then also it was just like generally unclear how to extend some of the guarantees of a point estimate uh, to like a true confidence interval. So that said, there is a lot of related work, um, which was very helpful. So we've got lots of different work on differentially private point estimators for means, or sorry, medians and quantiles. Um, there's a lot of work on confidence intervals for mean estimation, linear regression, I think Salil's gonna talk about some of that. And then there's this nice line of work on more general purpose, differentially private confidence intervals using tools such as bootstrapping. So, all right, so before I get into what we actually did, I'm gonna talk about what we did at first, which didn't work very well, and maybe you can take some takeaways from that. So the first thing you might think was, okay, well, the challenge of differentially private confidence intervals is that we have these two sources of error that we're handling, right? We have the error due to sampling, which is just inherent, and then we have this added error on top of that, which is due to differential privacy. And you could think, okay, you've got two different error probabilities. So you've got, you know, if beta ones, your probability that the non-private confidence interval captures the median. Then you could also say, okay, well, I'm just gonna throw beta two, which is just, I'm gonna have some sort of private confidence interval, and I'm gonna think about the probability that that, conf that confidence interval captures the non-private one. And then you're, I'm just gonna union bound them together and get my new confidence interval. Right, and have some sort of validated guarantee. And this is fine, right, it's valid, but it's going to be really overly conservative. And there's a reason for this, right? Because we don't actually need the non-private confidence interval to be inside of the private one in order for the private one to be a valid confidence interval, right? So like in that first image, we do have that being the case, but in the second one, both the blue confidence interval, which is the private one, and the purple one, which is non-private, they both capture the population median, but they're not completely overlapping. So what this means is that we can be a little bit more careful um, about analyzing the relationship between our two sources of error and get a much tighter coverage analysis to get to shrink those uh, confidence intervals down substantially. So if here we just focus on the bad event where our population medians to the right of our interval, um, yeah, right? Um, then we can rewrite this probability in terms of the uh, rank of the population median in the, like the empirical rank in our sample. Right? And when we know this, that rank is distributed binomially, so we can just rewrite this. And so now we're taking both sources of error together. And when we look at, in a second, 
the different mechanisms we consider, we can do bespoke analysis using this specific to our mechanisms and get much tighter guarantees. So, right, if you fall asleep for the rest of my talk, that's fine. But um, the one takeaway I want you to have, which for those of you who work in theory probably won't be that much of a surprise, is that um, throwing union bounds willy nilly at a problem isn't always the best solution. It's certainly the easiest one. But if you can be a little bit more clever and not do that, you'll get much better results. So you can take that with you. So that said, I haven't actually told you any of the privacy preserving mechanisms that we thought about to do this task. Um, like I said, there's been a lot of previous work on uh, privacy preserving quantiles. And we tried a lot of different things using previously existing techniques, ex techniques that we came up by ourselves. Um, if you want to read our whole appendix, they're all there. But the two that I'm going to talk about the most, because they end up being the most interesting, are, again, just our good old friend, the exponential mechanism, and then post-processing of the private CDF. Okay. So the exponential mechanism has been used for quantile estimation. I think it's in the original paper. Um, right. So that's nothing new. But just to review, um, we first discretize the output space um, uh, to some granularity. And then we take each possible output and we score it with this score function. Um, and then we choose an output with probability proportional to e to the score. We do use a slightly widened version of the exponential mechanism, which just like pushes that distribution out by a, a parameter theta. And the only reason why we do that is just it slightly better handles cases where the data is highly concentrated compared to the uh, run of the mill mechanism. Right. So uh, because the scoring function is in terms of the rank, uh, this uh, mechanism guarantees that you know your rank of your output is probably approximately uh, close to what your target rank is, right? So we can use this in combination with that uh, rewriting of the empirical rank of the population median, do some math that I'm not going to show you, and get some relatively tight confidence bounds on the median that are privacy preserving. So here you can see in red, that's just like the noisy distribution of that of the output. And you'll see that with high probability, it's always kind of like, it's always outside of the, at least in this example, it's always outside of that true confidence interval, sorry, or the non-private confidence interval. And it certainly contains the population median. Though this is only one run, of course. So we don't get a point estimator of the median directly out of this. Uh, you can if you want. We uh, throughout our work, we just use the midpoint of that confidence interval as an estimate instead of. You could imagine you could also like sacrifice additional privacy budget and estimate that using the exponential mechanism or your mechanism of choice. Uh, we generally found that that wasn't a a great idea, and if you've got a small privacy budget, it's better just to do this. Um, that said, this is a biased estimator. Uh, so if you care a lot about bias, it might not be uh, your best choice. And there's some open questions I'll get to towards the end that kind of loop back to this. Right. So this is a nice method, but uh, like many differential private things, it's also a black box, right? So we thought about this other method where instead you post process a private CDF to get some confidence intervals for the median out of that. And that's nice because you get the whole CDF out of it. Um, but we thought, OK, this is so much more information that there's no way that it will possibly do very well. All right, so there's, again, many works on differentially private CDFs. Um, we use specifically James Honecker's 2015 work on uh, this, which uh, basically computes the CDF using a binary tree. So you compute essentially a histogram at multiple levels of granularity, uh, as represented in this tree form. 
And then you can leverage the fact that at every level of the tree, those different sums should, like the sums at the bottom of the tree should sum up to the values of the nodes right above them, so even though, I mean, of course, you've added noise, so they won't, but you can use some nice post processing to get a very uh, a clean collection of the, the underlying counts of your histogram, and then from there you can get a CDF. Um, so how do we do this? Well, I'm first going to talk about how we do it in the naive case. So here, um, in red are all of the CDF estimates that we got from using this sort of tree based approach and we're able to get uh, confidence intervals on both on all, or error intervals on all of those estimates, which are in blue. Um, our in turquoise again is the is the tree population median and all we do we'll see if I can does this work oh ho okay so all right so here's the true thing and actually I want to go one slide further all right okay so here's the non private confidence interval that's where it should be and we just locate the point whose error bounds are just the left of the target quantile and just to the right of the target quantile. So here we have to go all the way. You'd think it'd be right here because here's the first one where the lower bound of the error is right above that. But actually we have to go a little further because it dips back down. And here is our other end of the quantile. All right. And if we pick those as our private confidence interval, we can guarantee that we have something that's valid. Uh, that said, right, we had to, for this, this one, we had to wait until this bottom error bar, the last time it crossed the target quantile, which was way out here. And that's partially because the CDF sort of naturally flattened because of the distribution we were looking at. This is not log normal data, I think. Um, and so as soon as you have this flattening happen, you end up with really, really wide confidence intervals. Right. So that seems not great. So instead, we can do this more careful analysis. And thankfully, um, through uh, Honecker's work, we do know the marginal distribution of our noisy CDF. Right. So we have this, uh, this uh, Gaussian noise added um, that has variance sigma squared. This variance is a little bit non-trivial to compute. We did have to do some sort of bespoke analysis for this. Uh, because you're taking this sort of binary tree of counts and then you're doing a bunch of recursive calculations on it to get out your final uh, estimators, uh, this variance is not independent or perfectly correlated. So we don't have like a closed form way of computing these things, but we do have a computational method for doing so. Uh, and you can, it's a bit time intensive, but you can pre process it. Um, right, but we do have that. And right, we also know that if uh, for some x that's less than the median, our noisy CDF is going to be stochastically dominated by, again, this binomial plus this noise term. Right. So, what this means is that for every value in our discretized range, we can find some a sub x, which is dependent only on this variance term of the count, such that if x is truly less than the median, then uh, the probability that our noisy CDF is greater than a sub x is less than or equal to alpha over two. Okay. So what we can do is we can essentially run a hypothesis test where we say, hey, for each x in our discretized range is the CDF or the noisy CDF greater than this a sub x that we've calculated. And then we can pick our upper limit of our confidence interval accordingly as the largest value of x where the test fails to reject. And we can calculate the lower bound in the same way or analogously. Okay, so here in pink, 
we've gone through and for each value in our discretized range, we've calculated these little a sub x's, which again, you can pre-process. Um, and then we have found the very first value above our target quantile, or sorry, that, so that it's failed to reject. All right, so here's, um, you see the red point is above the pink point. And here, this is the first one where the red point is below the pink point. Right, and so these become our uh, our private confidence interval. You'll note this is a lot better than our previous analysis, like pretty substantially better. Um, right, so, and again, the, the nice thing about this analysis is that you get the whole CDF out of it. So if you weren't just trying to get a confidence interval for the median, maybe you were doing some other data analysis as well, this would be a really nice way to go about doing it because you get all of this extra information. So we uh, evaluated our uh, stuff in a couple different ways. So we both used uh, simulated log normal data and we looked at uh, the 1940 census, both of different test, test beds. Um, I'm just gonna summarize the work using the simulated log normal data here. Um, so the first thing we did is we look at the relative width of the non-private and private confidence interval. So this is the 95% confidence interval divide, like its width divided by the private one. And you can see a couple of things. So first of all, as a general rule, uh, here in sort of this reddish maroon color, this is the, um, uh, exponential mechanism using the careful analysis, and it generally does better than anything else over uh, most regimes that we looked at. There are a couple where the CDF method does better, uh, which I won't go into. And then in pink, you have the CDF method. Right? So the main takeaway is that the exponential mechanism does best. CDF method doesn't do too badly, though, that being said. And you can also see that just like the, the union bound method does a lot worse than the other method. So here's the union bound CDF version, here's the non-union bound CDF. Here's the union bound version of the exponential mechanism, here's the non-union bound. Another way of interpreting this is you can think about, right, so the relative width, right, like here's here's relative width being two, that ratio being two. And so what that means is that if that ratio is less than two, right, it means that your uncertainty estimate due to privacy is like you, that added uncertainty is about the same as the underlying added uncert uh, uncertainty due to sampling, right? Um, so, so that one, that's just your non-private confidence interval, non-private, non-parametric confidence interval. We also in uh, turquoise have the parametric confidence interval for log normal data, but again, we've shown that maybe that's not a good assumption to make a lot of the time. Um, so this is great, but of course widths don't mean anything. Like you could have, you could have a really narrow confidence interval, but that would be bogus if it wasn't also valid. Like it didn't actually cover the thing. We think they're valid, but let's just double check. Um, all right, so here's the empirical coverage over 5,000 trials. You might hope like for the narrowest possible intervals, you would hope that it would truly follow this dotted line here. Um, and what we see is that it's overshooting quite a bit, right? So the union bounds methods really overshoot the true coverage. And then these improved methods still overshoot, but by not quite as much. So it's worth noting that this overshooting doesn't come at a huge, huge cost, right? If we think back to those um, that previous plot, the, um, the, the, the widths weren't that much bigger, but they are covering the population median substantially more. Um, so it maybe is not the worst thing in the world. Um, but it's also interesting to ask how much this is inherent to the question of privacy. Like, is there something just like very generally you can say about like how much more over coverage you have to do in the private setting, or if we worked hard enough, enough at this, could we get something that's tighter and tighter and tighter? Right, 
So in conclusion, um, we covered several different methods for generating differentially private confidence intervals. And there's more in the appendix of the paper if you want to look at them. Um, but these are kind of the two main ones. But the main takeaways that I'd like you to go away with aren't really specific necessarily to confidence intervals for mediums. Um, mostly, A, if you're doing this type of analysis, remember that union bounds aren't always your best choice. Um, the, the downside of doing this without the sort of like uh, cookbook union bound method is it does seem to require a much more bespoke analysis for every single possible mechanism you want to look at, but the downside. Um, right, and again, the exponential mechanism seems to perform best for this particular task, um, which is nice, you know, it did a lot better than like, for example, we did looked at a smooth sensitivity just for point estimates, not even for the confidence interval, because I don't know, I felt like the sort of uh, folklore was that that was going to do really well. It, it, and at least the way we were doing it didn't uh, exponential mechanism, good old exponential mechanism just does quite well. Um, and then secondly, the CDF estimators, not that much worse, and it gives you a lot more out of it, right? So that's just kind of nice. Um, some open questions, right? So I don't really, at least personally, see a good way of getting an unbiased point estimate from the, for the median from the exponential mechanism approach, but you might be able to get something less biased or something using all that information that the noisy CDF provides. That could be interesting. There's this general question about overcoverage of private confidence intervals. Um, the other thing that was really tempting to do when we were thinking about the CDF was to first do some pre or post processing rather before we did the post processing for the confidence interval where we project it to be monotone because of course a CDF should be monotone. But once you do that, it's really unclear how to do any of this analysis. So it'd be interesting to know how we could leverage the fact that we know it should be monotone in our analysis. But so far we haven't thought of anything like that. Um, Again, these are fairly bespoke analyses. It would be really great if we could have some more general purpose methods that have good finite sample validity um, and you know, aren't overly conservative. Uh, and then there's also this general question, of course, all of this analysis assumes samples that are IID. In real life, people sample using much more complex methodologies and there's really been no work about how to do private confidence intervals in those settings. And that's it. Thank you.